Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Citrus Research Exchange. I'm Brandi Nonicki. I'm the director of the Citrus Policy Lab, which supports interdisciplinary technology policy research and engagement. And just to let you know, this is actually the 10-year anniversary of the Citrus Research Exchange. We've hosted a remarkable lineup of technology innovators on this stage over the past 10 years and within the last semester. Um, the new schedule for Citrus Research Exchange talks will be going up for fall. Um, you can check those out at the Citrus website, which is citrus-uc.org, and those will be announced in the summer. Uh, today's Citrus Research Exchange is co-presented by the Citrus Policy Lab and the Samuelson Law Technology and Public Policy Clinic at Berkeley Law. Uh, so please join me in welcoming our guest speaker today, Sirus Farivar. He is an investigative tech reporter at NBC News and Plug, author of this book, Habeas Data, which he has copies available here on the podium. Today he will be sharing his work on 50 years of surveillance law in America. Uh, we ask that you don't interrupt during his presentation. We will be going around at the end with a microphone for question and answer. So a quick background on C. Roos. He's an investigative tech reporter at NBC News and also an author and radio producer. His second book, Habeas Data, about the legal cases over the last 50 years that have had an outsized impact on surveillance and privacy law in America. Um, is now well. This is already published. It was published yeah. May eighth, two thousand eighteen. Yeah, in two thousand seventeen, uh, Sirius and Joe Mullen won the Technology Reporting Award from the Society of Professional Journalists, Northern California chapter, for their August two thousand sixteen story, "Stealing Bitcoins with Badges: How Silk Road's Dirty Cops Got Caught." Cyrus's first book, The Internet of Elsewhere, about the history and effects of the internet on different countries around the world, including Senegal, Iran, Estonia, and South Korea, was published in April 2011. From 2010 until 2012, Cyrus was the SciTech editor and host of Spectrum at Deutsche Welle English, Germany's international broadcaster. He has also reported for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, National Public Radio, Public Radio International, The Economist, Wired, The New York Times, and many others. He's also survived three VFDs on Wikipedia. However, on a fourth attempt in February 2007, he was in fact deleted. He was added back briefly in 2015, then deleted again. Ah, oh, his PGB key and other sources, you can check out his website. Um, also, he's an avid Twitter person, so I recommend following him on Twitter, I do, and I get scoops on lots of emerging tech policy issues. So without thank further you. ado, thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. Hey, what's up, everyone? How you guys doing? Uh, thanks for joining me. Thank you to Citrus. Uh, thank you to the, to the Cal community. Um, I am from a long line of very proud Cal Golden Bears. Uh, I'm the fourth generation, non-consecutively, if you're keeping score at home, uh, uh, to go to Cal. My aunt went to Cal, her parents went to Cal, and three out of their four parents went to Cal. Um, I myself graduated in 2004 uh, and with a degree in political economy, although I spent most of my time majoring really in the Daily Californian, uh, which produced uh, a number of other journalists um, who are still out there doing journalism. So a lot of this got started uh, back before, before the Daily Cal moved across the street here. It used to be in that big Ugly, uh, ugly Eshelman Tower um, down on the other side of campus. So that's where I spent a lot of my time. Uh, and these days I live down the road in Oakland, so you might see me biking around. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, uh, thank you for that kind introduction. As was said, I am a um, tech reporter at uh, NBC News. Um, I just very recently, a month and a half-ish ago, uh, changed jobs. I used to work for a long time um, for a tech news website called Ars Technica. Anybody heard of that? OK, cool. If you have not, um, I recommend it. I'm now a subscriber, even though I don't, I, I don't get paid by them anymore. But uh, uh, it's a great website. Um, uh, Ars Technica is a tech news website that's a sister publication of The New Yorker and Wired. We're under the, or ours is under the Conde Nast uh, umbrella. Um, and this book, in many ways, is kind of a culmination of the last five, six-ish years of my work at Ars Technica. It's a book about the intersection between the law and technology uh, and it comes from a very, 
I would say, I, maybe I hate to, shouldn't admit this, but it comes from a very ignorant place. When I started reporting on legal issues, I've been a tech reporter my whole professional career, but hadn't focused on, on legal issues. Um, I started from a place where I felt like I didn't know anything, and maybe, maybe you don't either. I don't know how many law students or lawyers are in the room. Um, uh, well, here, we can find out. How many law students or lawyers are in the room? Okay, a couple. So if I get anything legally wrong, feel free to correct me. It's, I, it's been known to happen. Um, but I started out from a place of, of real ignorance where, where you know, I would hear these phrases, right? Lawyers love these kind of pithy phrases, right? Like who's heard of the phrase like reasonable expectation of privacy? Have you heard that phrase ever? Okay, how many of you, uh, our lawyer friend over here, don't raise your hand. Um, uh, how many people are, know like wh what that phrase like means legally speaking and like where it came from? Okay, great. So I have something to, to teach you, right? So that's like what this book is about. So like the, the story of where that phrase comes from uh, is, a, is a really good example of this. And that's actually, you know, not coincidentally, the beginning of my book. So this book covers 50 years of surveillance law in America. And 50 years is not, you know, just because 50 is a nice round number, which it is. Um, but uh, 50 years ago, measured from 2017 back to 1967, 1967 is the year that the, that the Supreme Court uh, ruled in a case called Katz versus United States. Um, Charles Katz was a, a pretty small time gambler living in Los Angeles at the time. And he was a guy who was interested in making bets on college basketball games or and college football games a little bit. Uh, he lived in LA on Sunset Boulevard, uh, down the street from the Chateau Marmont Hotel. Um, he liked to walk down the street he, used, he preferred a certain bank of payphones, and he would go down there to these payphones, and he would put in his quarters, and he would call his bookies in, uh, in the East Coast somewhere, uh, and he would say things, say these like kind of impenetrable gambling phrases, like, you know, put a nickel on Dunesk, or that was like an actual phrase he said, which the police believed, you know, put $5,000 on Dunesk, um, which is a university I'd never heard of until I started researching this case. Um, I think they're somewhat good at basketball, maybe? I don't know. Um, but so, um, so this is what he did. So he did this for a period of time, and he made a living at it, actually. Um, and he otherwise was kind of a very ordinary, boring person, uh, Charles Katz. Um, he, according to the police officer, one of the LAPD officers who arrested him, who I interviewed for the book, um, described him as somebody who, you know, wouldn't have looked out of place in mid-1960s Hollywood. Uh, uh, you know, would wear suits, would kind of, you know, just walk down the street, you know, carried a briefcase, uh, looked very ordinary. Um, and yet, this is what he was doing, was making these calls. And, and obviously, you know, interstate gambling is illegal. Uh, and so this got the attention, uh, Charles Katz's gambling, drew the attention of the FBI and the LAPD. And so what they did was they started surveilling him. First, they started surveilling him physically, right? So they would watch. They could see, OK, he likes to go. He likes to walk from his apartment over here to, to the phone booths at a certain time. Sometimes he would stay at home and call. Um, they went so far as to rent out the apartment next to his. Sometimes they would hear him like in plain voice uh, you know, on the balcony, like in front of his house, and they had the balcony next door that the, that the police had rented. They could hear him on the phone. Um, they, they kind of observed his patterns of movement. And eventually, they said, OK, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put a recording device uh, on top of the phone booths that he likes to use. So this is um, 1965 that we're talking about when he's doing this. Um, uh, you know, if you can imagine, I know phone booths are pretty rare these days, but you know, we've all seen Superman. Um, so right, so there's a bank of three phone booths. They decided to put uh, a recording device uh, on top of the phone booths. And if you've ever spent any time digging through court documents, um, you probably know uh, lawyers, they, lawyers love words. They tend not to love pictures, generally. So we don't have pictures, unfortunately, of what these recording devices look like. So what I imagine when I, when I was reading about this is like you know a big 1960s like real audio recorder, right? It's probably huge, right? And so what they did was they put this recording device on top of the phone booth, two of them actually, um, and a microphone pointed down, basically, and they would watch Charles Katz walk down the street. Somebody would radio to somebody else, being like, "Okay, he's coming," and then the, they would somebody would scamper up these phone booths press record on the thing, and then scamper down. So for the purpose of catching him on the phone, right? And so you might ask yourself, why didn't they just wiretap him? That's a good question. We've all seen The Wire. We know how this goes. Um, they didn't wiretap him because they didn't, the police felt that they didn't need to. 
the, re the fact that they put the recording devices on top of the phone booths and not inside or not even tried to get a wiretap are really interesting because one of the ways that we think about or that courts have, have historically thought about the Fourth Amendment, um, particularly prior to this, uh, to this case, prior to the 1960s, dates back to a case even further back, 40 years earlier, called Olmstead. The basics of Olmstead are that there is a, a Seattle police officer named Roy Olmstead who decided that being a police officer in the 20s, in the middle of prohibition, uh, you know, we're not lucrative enough, so he decided to become a bootlegger. So he's run, so he's bootlegging out of Seattle, running liquor all over the Northwest. Eventually, the police do wiretap Roy Olmsted's home. They hear his voice on the wire, and they uh, catch him in the act of bootlegging. Okay, case gets cha case gets challenged all the way up to the Supreme Court. Eventually, uh, the Supreme Court, in a majority opinion written by Chief Justice William Howard Taft, and next time you're at legal pub trivia. Uh, Chief Justice Taft, of course, was the only uh, uh, Supreme Court justice who was also president, right? So he was Chief Justice after he was president, and he's the you know big dude with the mustache who got stuck in a bathtub, that guy. Um, so this is the guy we're talking about who wrote this line in the Olmstead case. He said, uh, there was no searching, there was no seizure, meaning it was okay for the police to wiretap Roy Olmstead at his home because they didn't capture anything. They didn't trespass onto his property. Right? They didn't need a police. There was no question of, of warrants because what did they do? They like listened to sound that was like traversing a wire. It's very ethereal and mystical kind of. Right? They didn't actually like seize anything or trespass anything. So, in the opinion of the court at the time, 1920s, the Olmsted case, uh, there was no searching, there was no seizure, no Fourth Amendment problem. The, the wiretap is all good, uh, so that's fine. So, that means that when we get back to our friend Mr. Katz in the 1960s in LA, the police were very clever and continue to be clever today applied to different technologies in different situations, which is that they said, OK, we don't need anything to put, to put a listening device on top of the phone booth. We're not inside. We haven't physically penetrated the, the physical space, the physical box of the phone booth. So we're going to put it on top. Cool. Uh, we don't know exactly why. I mentioned that there was a bank of three phone booths. I don't, it's not clear uh, from the court record why. Uh, they didn't have why they didn't put recording devices on top of all three um, because it the court records does say that they um, put a, a paper sign in the window of one of the booths that said out of order to convince uh, Charles Katz that he should only go to these two because those were the only two that had microphones he didn't know that obviously but uh, I just I, I don't know if they didn't have the budget for a third one or, or what but um, I find that really interesting so okay so they set up their quarter their uh, you know, they, 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 uh, he comes down, they record him over the course of six days. Uh, not, they don't just like leave it running, right? They have this whole team of people in different places. They're only recording him, right? They're, they're, they're taking great pains to not record other people. Um, eventually, once they feel like they have enough evidence against him, the police uh, come in and arrest him. Uh, I mentioned, I, I spoke with this previous uh, LAPD uh, officer, uh, Joseph Gunn, who's now long retired from the LAPD. Uh, and he told me that Katz was uh, very polite. He didn't resist. Um, he uh, just, you know, you know, did what the officers told him to do. They walked him a few blocks uh, down to uh, his apartment. They had a warrant to search his apartment. They gathered rolls of quarters, bedding materials, sports magazines. Uh, he was a handicapper, right? So, so he studied sports outcomes and made bets on them. That's what that's what his business was. Um, so he kept doing that. And they eventually, so they got all this stuff. They had a warrant to search the apartment. And he gets federally prosecuted for gambling. Because obviously, you know, even back then and even today, in most instances, uh, interstate gambling is illegal. So we come to this situation where the, his defense be, you know, begins. He's federally prosecuted. And his, and his lawyers make this argument. And they say, look, the sir, you know, this whole like, crazy recording setup that you have, uh, all of that is, is unconstitutional, right? We, you need a warrant to record inside this phone booth. Um, and the police say no, because you know, we didn't penetrate the phone booth. And so they, they make this argument at the, the, the district court level, the lowest court in, in Los Angeles. Um, Katz and his lawyers lose. They appeal up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in, in San Francisco. It might have been heard in Pasadena, uh, but they lose again. Um, eventually, the case gets up to the Supreme Court, um, and it's heard. Uh, in, in 1967, this is just after uh, Thurgood Marshall uh, takes the, 
is appointed or is, is uh, ascends to the, to the bench. Um, he actually didn't participate in the decision of this case because he previously had come from the office of the Solicitor General, which as you may know is the wing of the Department of Justice that you know, deals with Supreme Court cases in, in many instances. Um, so he actually didn't participate in the decision of that. But, um, but this is the kind of moment in which uh, they start talking about this and ultimately the Supreme Court makes this ruling in this case um, where they say that yes, this was a violation and a phone booth is just like your home, your office, a taxi, a hotel room, other places where you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. That's what this means, right? And so we think about, and so meaning the government could not record Mr. Katz in his phone booth even if he was gambling without a warrant, that they needed a warrant to do that. And so this phrase, is almost like a shorthand for understanding um, how the government can conduct surveillance um, using different types of technology. Um, and this is something that I didn't really fully understand. And I, didn't, I certainly didn't understand this story uh, until I went and, uh, and you know, interviewed people that were involved. Charles Katz has long passed away, um, but I spoke with uh, not only the police officer, I spoke with his, his lawyer, Harvey Schneider, um, who did the, a lot of the arguing at the Supreme Court, who's now a uh, happily retired uh, LA Superior Court judge, uh, living his life <laughs> watching UCLA basketball uh, in LA. Very nice guy. Um, <laughs> I spoke with, um, uh, does he bet? I don't think so, but I should ask. Um, uh, I spoke with um, an, a couple of other interesting people. Um, a name that if you know, if you've been following the kind of like legal discussion around, around Trump and stuff lately, a name that you may have seen uh, lately is uh, somebody by the name of Larry Tribe, who's a pretty well-known Harvard Law professor these days. Larry Tribe was a Supreme Court clerk during this case and actually um, uh, in, his, in his telling, uh, you know, played a particularly key role in, um, in helping the court to think about the fact that the Fourth Amendment does not rely upon uh, this question of physical trespass, although it still does in many ways, but it doesn't, it's not limited to that. And that was one of his key uh, kind of insights. So this phrase, reasonable expectation of privacy, we, we live with it today. It's the kind of legal standard uh, for a lot of these cases that stem from it. And my, my book focuses on 10 cases, not all of them are Supreme Court, um, that kind of represent, I would say, different markers uh, along the way over the last 10 years. The most recent case, which was decided uh, in 2018, early 2018, it was argued in late 2017, um, is a case called Carpenter, and it involves, as you might imagine, you know, in these in these kind of uh, cases, they often involve kind of strange, uh, small-time kind of criminal situations. Um, so, in the case of uh, the more recent cases, is a case called Carpenter. It involves a guy named Tim Carpenter. Um, he's actually one of three different Tims in this criminal gang that's involved in sticking up radio shacks and uh, cell phone stores in Michigan and, uh, Michigan and Ohio, circa 2010, 2011. Um, there's a whole episode on Planet Money about this particular case, if you're interested in more details about that. Uh, but so in this gang of, of you know, st of, of the stick-up crew, there's uh, uh, Little Tim Carpenter, uh, Big Tim, and also Tim Tim. I don't know why you need three different guys named Tim in a, in a robbery gang, but whatever. Um, so Little Tim Carpenter uh, is one of the leaders of the group. And the police in, in you know, they're, they're going around, but it's like the most basic stick up that you can imagine. They have laundry bags, they have a getaway car, they have masks, they run in with guns, uh, and they're going after, you know, the Galaxy 3 or whatever the newest, like, you know, iPhone equivalent was at the time, uh, you know, literally threw them in a bag and drive away. And they're like hitting multiple uh, sites uh, in the Midwest, Michigan and Ohio, uh, in this period of time. And eventually the police catch somebody, that guy flips, he gives up, uh, little Tim Carpenter's phone number. With the phone number, the police are able to present a court order known as a, a D order um, <coughs> to uh, Metro PCS, his cell phone provider. And the court order says, hey, Metro PCS, um, here's this guy that we're interested in. Um, can you please give us uh, access to, can you please turn over his location records, right? His um, his cell site location information, CSLI. Can you tell us where his phone was every few seconds, which, you know, cell phone towers do that, right? But like our phones are pinging back and forth to the tower all the time. Um, so over a period of 127 days so that we can show uh, that, yeah, he was, you know, at the scenes of this Radio Shack robbery and this one and this one and this one. Um, 
And, uh, and so they do that, and they get the, they get the records. Um, and again, eventually this case over, takes several years, uh, unlike Katz, which took two years, uh, to get up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court was, at, was tasked with answering, with, with answering the question, is it okay for the police to obtain such a vast record of very granular, very detailed information about somebody, such as you know, their, their location, over 127 days without a warrant? The court order that they got is not the same thing as a warrant. It does not require a probable cause showing of a crime. Uh, it merely required showing a relevancy to an ongoing investigation, which legally speaking is a much lower bar. Um, and ultimately, and this just happened last year, uh, the Supreme Court said, no, you need a warrant to get that kind of information, even though the law presently does not require you to get that. Um, and so this is, this is that case, Carpenter, um, is, is very interesting because it's one of a, a, a series of three cases in recent years, I read about the others in the book too, um, that kind of illustrate that um, you know, we have this kind of interesting moment in the 60s with the reasonable expectation of privacy. We have um, some more recent cases where the court is starting to think about privacy in that kind of way, uh, in, in sort of a more pro-privacy way uh, now. But then, as you might imagine, right, there are all these other kind of weirdo fringe scenarios. I don't know if you guys saw uh, uh, the headline that just happened. Um, it, was, it, it, ha it was announced yesterday that I saw the Washington Post story on it this morning uh, about this guy who works for Apple, who flew into San Francisco airport last December, and he uh, was stopped by the Border Patrol coming in from overseas. He's a US citizen, and he was asked by the Border Patrol to unlock, to digitally unlock his devices, his phone and his laptop, and he refused. Um, and this, this is really interesting because, uh, you know, in a, in a border situation, and this is another kind of weird element of the law that I have come to understand, is that the border in the government's view, in the American government's view, is a very special place. Um, it is one of these weird, uh, it ha the government has special powers at the border that it doesn't normally have, right? So if you've ever driven, if you've ever flown in from out overseas, or if you've come across the Mexico or Canadian border, you've probably had this experience uh, of, of having your stuff searched, uh, whether you want to or not. Um, the government claims that the Fourth Amendment, you know, there's an exception to the Fourth Amendment at the border. Now that we have devices like phones and computers that have really good encryption that's on by default, that a lot of people have, um, the government claims that it can force you to decrypt your devices. And the law is not totally clear as to whether that's correct or not. Um, we have um, a, ca a case currently ongoing in federal court in Massachusetts that involves a number of, of plaintiffs uh, from other parts of the country. You guys may remember a couple years ago in, in 2017, there was a case of a JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory scientist, who got stopped at the border, who had his iPhone. He was, he was asked to open his iPhone. There was a, a guy who teaches at Cal, uh, California College of the Arts in Oakland, um, who's an artist, uh, teaches art there, um, had a similar situation, SFO. So that case is ongoing. And one of the things that that case relies on, so it's basically, it's them, it's th these plaintiffs who were forced to open their phones, um, suing, uh, suing the government, saying that because of this Carpenter decision, this most recent one with the guys with the stick up and little, and little Tim Carpenter, because of that, because the court said that we all have phones and we all have a privacy interest in our phones, that the government should not be able to force people to open their phones, but they do. Um, and if you ask the government, like, what authority do you have to do this? Why do you do this? They say, well, you know, uh, you know the legal precedent says that, that we, we have this kind of special power at the border and we can do that. And um, oh, and by the way, uh, border searches of devices are you know, infinitesimally small compared to the number of people that are coming into the country uh, every day. So, you know, you don't really need to worry about it. So it's, you know, it's fine. Um, so, you know, depending on how you feel about the government's reasoning there uh, may depend on, on how you might feel about that. Um, but this guy, again, you know, just yesterday, th this, this became public. He went to the ACLU and he said, hey, I want to file a complaint. Uh, and he came public, uh, he went public with his allegations that he was um, stopped at the border and, and was asked to open his devices. And he refused and he asked for a lawyer. And eventually after some back and forth with the agents, the agents took his, um, his global entry card. Uh, if you guys have ever traveled overseas, you can get this sort of like the TSA pre, but for international, right? They took his global entry card um, for some reason uh, and they gave him his devices back and they ultimately let him go. 
And that's interesting because in many of these other cases that I've reported on, people uh, who, who maybe challenge in many instances kind of acquiesce you know, like, and you can you you can sort of think about like, what would you do? You know, I imagine what I would do if I you know if I had like, you know, my family with me, uh, and I was in a rush to get somewhere. Like, am I going to sit there and have like a constitutional argument with some like angry CPB agent for like four hours uh, and maybe miss my flight or whatever? Like, maybe not. You know, um, so I don't know. So it's a it's a really tricky situation. The law is continuing to evolve, um, and um, and yeah, and so so. My book kind of covered, there's a lot of, of that in between that I'm, that I'm not going to uh, get into at the moment. But I did, just before I finish and throw it over to questions, I did want to just touch a little bit on um, one of my favorite uh, subjects and technologies that I've written about quite a lot, uh, which is license plate readers. How many of you guys are familiar with license plate readers? OK, a few people. Um, so license plate readers, as you, as you may know, right, are this technology that uh, captures license plates. They're in use here in Berkeley and Oakland. Um, you know, at, at cities big and small across America, uh, they work essentially on the same technology that your desktop scanner do, works on, right? They use optical character recognition to recognize le numbers and letters on your license plate. That sounds great. Um, they, they are designed with a, I think, a noble purpose, which is to, you know, catch bad guys, wanted cars, stolen cars, amber alerts. Uh, I learned a fun new term from the police, which is silver alerts, which is when senior citizens go missing for whatever reason. Police call that a silver alert. Uh, I didn't make this up. Um, so, um, so what they do is, right, so, so, so in Oakland, there's something like 30 different Oakland police cars that have these cameras mounted on top of the car, usually in front of the light bar. So next time you see a Berkeley police or Oakland police car going by, you can take a quick look. If you can, you'll see like a little black rectangle on the top of the, of the roof, uh, and that's what it's doing. And so it's scanning at incredible speeds of 60, up to 60 plates per second. Um, which is incredibly, incredibly fast. Um, and when I first heard about this technology, you know, six, seven years ago, and I started realizing how pervasive it was around the country, not only here in the Bay Area, but in many cities in America, I started to want to know, again, about the kind of legal history and why this was allowed and whether there was a specific rule or law that enabled these things. And this is where I started to get into this weird question of reasonable expectation of privacy. And in another case that I won't get into right now that's also in the book, uh, the Supreme Court in a case from, from the year I was born, 1982, um, in a case called Knotts versus United States, K-N-O-T-T-S, like Knotts Berry Farm in Southern California, um, the Supreme Court found in that case that there is no reasonable expectation of privacy when you're in public. Right? So the court found that you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your home, in your office, at your doctor's office, at your hotel, your taxi, in your phone booth, even if you're you know, making illegal gambling bets, as, they, as you know, our friend Charles Katz was. But you don't have that when you're in public. So what that means is, is that the police can gather all kinds of information about you, um, can obtain all kinds of information, what, the, what is often referred to as non-search information. And this is, again, a weird like, legal distinction that I think most of us who aren't lawyers don't always understand, which is that you know, the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures, but it doesn't protect against all searches, and it doesn't protect it against things that are not searches from a legal definitional standpoint. Right? So a license plate reader, in the eyes of the police, is not a search. And also, you're in public, so we're good. So we can, even though this legal president from the early 1980s, when license plate readers did not exist, uh, or were you know, in the very early stages of being researched and developed, um, nowadays, the result of that is the Oakland Police Department has 33 license plate readers, and they capture plates at 60 plates per second, and they have a record, a database of millions of license plates. And I know this because I filed a public records request with the city of Oakland for all plates that they had ever captured. And they sent back me, sent back to me 4.6 million records of plates, dates, times, GPS locations going back five years. Um, so that gave me probably a really, really, really creepy superpower uh, that I had uh, of all this data. And it's real, and, and once you, once I came to understand that the law has had these consequences that I think in many instances are not foreseen. It doesn't take long to kind of come to the realization, I think, that you know, if it's true, if, the, if, the, if what the law has held that it's true, it's OK for the police to capture license plate records as they do today. If that's true today, in 
six months, a year, two years, three years, maybe, maybe uh, you know, slightly longer than that. But like in the very near future, it's going to be, from a legal perspective, it's going to be okay for the police to capture people's faces, right? Because, at, because if it's true that we don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in public, then it holds, legally speaking, I think, uh, that you know, police's body cameras or other types of sensors can capture all kinds of other data about us. The Supreme Court may, if they get to that point, if there is a case, if you know somebody gets arrested and they challenge, and it takes five or eight or ten or years to get to the Supreme Court to decide that, maybe we'll get a different answer. But as we all know, the wheels of justice move slowly, and the wheels of technology move very quickly. <laughs> so, and that's one of the things that I that I. Um, didn't fully understand or realize when I first started writing this book, which is that I thought, you know, when I, the kind of working hypothesis I had when I first started was, you know, these judges, most of them are like older white dudes uh, and they, you know, are really like out of touch and they wouldn't know the difference between a body camera and a drone and a license plate reader if it hit them in the face. Um, but what I also came to realize was, was, and this is, you know, kind of spoiling the ending of my own book, uh, so sorry about that. Um, which is that we can't wait for the Supreme Court or the California Supreme Court or any other court for that matter to tell us what the answer is. We can't wait the two, three, five, ten years for a group of judges to decide. Nothing against judges, they're great, but we, we just can't wait that long because technology moves so fast. And so if we're concerned about these issues, if we're concerned that Really soon, like so, right, the facial recognition technology that I described in very loose terms, as probably many of you already know, is in use right now in China. Like people are getting arrested based on that. Um, it's being tested in the UK. It's being tested in the United States at airports. Um, I'm not aware of it being integrated into into body cameras yet. But if if a company announced that they were doing it tomorrow, I would totally believe it. Um, it's happening very, very rapidly. And if you work in the field of, of, of technology as, or research, as, as I think many of you do, uh, you understand this better than me. Um, so I would say we need to take a lot more steps earlier in the process before we wait for a court to tell us stop, right? Um, so what, is that, what, what does that look like? One of the things, that, one, of the, one of the methods that that, that looks like is something that we're doing um, in Oakland, uh, which is called the Oakland Privacy Advisory Commission, which is a really, really cool idea. Basically, they're the privacy watchdog for the city of Oakland. So there are, they're a commission. Each commissioner is appointed by a member of the city council. Uh, they have regular meetings. You can get on their email list, even if you don't want to go downtown to go sit in the Thursday night meetings. Uh, you can get their agendas and, and documentation and stuff. Their job is to evaluate any technology that the city wants to acquire that may impinge people's privacy. Literally, I just got the agenda for a new policy that they're discussing about license plate readers. How long should the city of Oakland be able to keep uh, the records that they obtain, that they gather uh, from, from license plate reader data? Um, who should have access to it? Who should not have access to it? What purpose is it for? Should that data be shared with ICE? Oakland would say no, because Oakland is a sanctuary city and the state of California is theoretically a sanctuary state. Um, this is an issue that's continuing to be debated right now, is that these technologies that were sort of you know, set up for one thing are also being used to do something else. And once uh, lawmakers realize that, they may have, they may have a lot of questions. Um, so they have these meetings where they meet with, they have police representatives, they have city representatives, these commissioners, um, some of them have technical backgrounds, some of them have legal backgrounds, some of them have just like activism backgrounds. Some of them, one of, one of, them, one of the guys is a, is a former cop, uh, one of them is a young you know, Muslim activist uh, uh, who grew up in Central California. Uh, it's a wide range of people, um, and I think it's really an interesting and thoughtful way um, where they can have an open and honest discussion with um, Oak, you know, representatives from the city of Oakland who hopefully want to do good work and good policing to stop you know, the 80 or so on average people that are getting murdered in the city of Oakland to say, to say nothing of the you know other kinds of awful crimes that happen in in Oakland and and you know multiply that by however many cities you know in America right there's obvious real crime that happens um, I think none of us want that to happen but this is the sort of trade-off that we live by by living in a, in a free society is that we sort of allow uh, you know because we don't want to live in a police state we have constitutional rights and so on um, we have to kind of figure out uh, that balance. So um, this is something that we're doing in Oakland. I'm not aware of any other city that has a, a privacy commission in the same kind of way. Uh, there are other cities that are very, uh, you know, thinking about, about this, this in, in similar ways. The city of Berkeley, um, the city of Davis, Santa Clara County have uh, 
instituted local ordinances saying, for example, that um, data collected for you know, license plate readers cannot be shared with ICE, for example. Um, so there have been some movements in that respect. But the idea of having a dedicated group of people to discuss these issues, uh, I think, is really, really interesting. Um, so uh, that is you know, the long and the short of it. I know that's, uh, that's a lot of uh, information and legal history to throw at you all at once. Uh, but I do very much appreciate your attention and the invitation and your time. So thank you very much. There's mics that are going to be floating around. While we're, while we're doing that, um, I have five books with me. They're 25 bucks each. I accept Venmo, PayPal, not Bitcoin, uh, you know, US dollars, uh, euros if you have them for some reason, <laughs> uh, you know, things like that. But yeah, come find me after. I'll be hanging out. Happy to sign books. Um, the gentleman yeah. with the microphone, and then if you could pass it to the yeah. gentleman. Yeah, so three. my yes. question is, um, digital signage is becoming ubiquitous. Digital and, signage? Yeah. And what do you mean by that? I mean video kiosks, and oh, okay. what's happening is that they're attaching cameras to it, right. reading the faces, right. and essentially delivering ads based on who's in front of the kiosk. Right, like a and, minority report kind of deal. Exactly, but that's real, and that's going to happen within right. the next five to ten years. Right. And according to GDPR and CCA standards, which are the privacy laws, right. they meet those standards. And one of the arguments is they sanitize the video in much the same way they aggregate cell phone data. Right. Um, question to you is, what are your thoughts about that when the police start asking for the records in the so-called de-search process as you described it? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, and it's, and it's interesting because, um, so before I jump into the specifics of that, um, so my book focuses on surveillance, right? So like government activity of people, of citizens, right? Um, that is related to, but not exactly the same thing as what what in the legal world people refer to as you know privacy. GDPR and um, CCPA, the new California law that is going to come into effect in January next year, um, uh, that that is sort of the California version of GDPR in a way. Um, regulates the activities of private companies uh, as it pertains to you know, digital data uh, in, in that sense. But it does not govern what the government itself does. Um, but you're right. I think that any time a private company gathers data, whether it's cell site location information, whether it's license plate reader data, I didn't even mention the fact, right? So like the Oakland police and the Berkeley police are running around with their own little cameras and doing their own license plate reader scans. What I didn't even mention is that there's another company down the road in Livermore uh, that has the great name of Vigilant Solutions, um, which claims to be the world's largest private license plate reader company, have the world's largest uh, uh, license plate database. They claim to hold 10 billion records um, of plates from around uh, the country. Um, so I think that any time you build a system, whether, whether it's the, uh, and, and when you were saying that, it made me think of those um, repurposed um, New York City phone booth spaces, not the booths themselves, but the physical locations that they embody, that there are these like New York City Wi-Fi kiosks. I don't know if that's what you were referring to, because um, those have cameras in them as well. And I've heard reports that, uh, that, again, similarly, right, they're capturing all kinds of other data, and that can become a trove for police to, to access. Um, and so I think that any time there is any kind of like public infrastructure, um, whether it's stationary, you know, literally bolted to a piece of cement or driving around, uh, and I'm thinking of like, right, we, we live in a world where autonomous cars already exist. They're not common yet, but they will be very soon. Um, and I remember this point was really driven home to me when I interviewed a, um, a police lieutenant at the Mountain View Police Department, and he, he likened it to, he likened autonomous cars uh, to basically TiVo on wheels, right? It's a computer that has all kinds of sensors that's just like driving around and capturing all kinds of stuff. And so if you're a police officer, that's great. His job, this guy that I, that I talked to, his job is to like reconstruct traffic accidents and investigate traffic accidents. That's his job. But like even if uh, an autonomous car isn't involved in the accident, if it happens to be driving by and it happens to capture all kinds of stuff, of course the police want that data. Um, so I think that's, uh, you know, now that we live in a world where, where computers are everywhere and are almost everything, um, 
we run the risk of that being made available to law enforcement in kind of an easy, easier kind of way than maybe is anticipated. I don't know if that totally answers your question, but uh, yeah, it's definitely an, er an area of concern. And another question. Oh yeah. So, some of the, you can wait for the courts to eventually decide on these criminal cases, sure. but some protections for privacy against government surveillance or around record keeping and sure. custody have come from particular incidents. Right. And I'm wondering what you think of creating incidents that make the point to enforce uh, vigilance on the part of legislators. So uh -huh. famously, when, when Clarence Thomas was uh, nominated, his records of what he borrowed for videos became a matter of, and then instantly, fastest moving right. legal protection of all time right. for privacy, specifically around video tape rentals. I, I love, that. yeah, okay. I, I, so, I, I so was hoping that's where you're going okay. with that. In the same <laughs> spirit, um, I was asked to, by you know, a longtime Oakland EFF member, I was uh -huh. like, what would you do if you had a team of people running around with license plate readers? Mm -hmm. And I thought immediately surveil the government itself yeah. to to you know show the INS officers coming to work, going home, and all that, and pushing the limits on whatever the protections are right now on disclosing the addresses of law enforcement officers, where they are every minute, whether they're you know going off to see their little you know girl on the side or whatever <laughs> guy on the side, or just going to buy marijuana from the dispensary, yeah, <laughs> right, or whatever, right. all like, these legal activities, yeah. right? Just maximum embarrassment. I'm I'm wondering whether. Um, uh, your time might be better spent brainstorming with the EFF folks versus uh, being on the Privacy Advisory Commission yeah. or compiling the very slow-moving results You're, of our justice system. I think you raise a really good point, and I can tell you, having interviewed all the members of the Privacy Commission, that one of the one of the commissioners is a very interesting guy named Lou Katz, unrelated to Charles Katz, uh, as far as I know. Um, Lou Katz is well known. He helped create Usenix like way back in the day. He's this, he's, he, I describe him very lovingly in the book as, as the kind of like lefty grandpa of the group. He's in his 80s. He's very opinionated and, and fun. And um, he keeps telling me and I keep bugging him. I'm like, hey, Lou, when are we going to go drive around? Because you don't have to have a fancy piece of hardware to, do, you know, there's like literally open ALPR software that is out there already and has been for years. And I don't think it would be that hard to do exactly what you just described. Um, and in fact, Oakland makes it e pretty easy. Uh, if you want to know what is the mayor's license plate or what are the, what are the city council members' license plates, um, next time you're down at Oakland City Hall, go take, I don't know if Berkeley does this, but Oakland City Hall has dedicated street parking spots. So it says District 1, reserve parking. So you're like, oh, that's Dan Cobb's car right there. And that's his license plate number is whatever it is. Uh, you know, And you could just do that for all of them, right? Um, uh, for and. Perhaps if you you know poked around uh, the police headquarters, you could probably figure out what the police chief's you know personal license plate is too. Um, but you're right, I haven't done that, but I think that that would be a very effective way to go about it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go, Jason. Hey, Sarus. What's up? <clears throat> um, question about you went in this a little bit. Um, uh, being forced to unlock a phone. Yeah. I've heard, and I just, I don't know if this is true, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, that it, in the purposes of the current law, mm -hmm. a police officer can force you to unlock a phone with a thumbprint, but cannot force you to disclose a password if you have a text password, say, locking your iPhone. Can you talk about that? And sure. then, And then just a quick other thing. Don't CBP have devices that can just brute force passwords anyways that they can you know if you refuse to unlock something they bring it into a back room yeah they plug it in yeah. it's some israeli software Celebrate. and it yeah yeah um yes uh so the question was in and this is where it gets weird um and you know i would say number one talk to a lawyer if you really want to know like the real answer but my understanding is that for a non-border situation if you're stopped by the Berkeley police and the, and the policeman says, hey, uh, uh, you know, unlock your phone, if you do it, like, like they can say that, right? Like they, they're, they're, right, they're, there are ways that police can get around uh, the warrant situation, right? Like if a police officer comes to your house and says, can I come in your house? Can I open your trunk or can you open your trunk for me? Right, that's what's called a consent search, right? You've consented to the search, you've said yes. Um, uh, lawyers, I think everywhere would tell you if the police say, can I come into your house? You say, 
no, unless you, you know, like really want them to come to your house for some reason. But like, um, but right. So, so you were, you you raised a really interesting point, which is that there's this current. The law right now, as it stands, is not totally clear. But there seems to be this strange split between um, what you know and what you are. Right. So like, if your pa if the passcode to your phone is your thumbprint or your retina scan or some biometric feature that opens up your device. Um, the law as it stands now says that you can be compelled to do to provide that biometric in the same way that you can be compelled to provide a blood sample or a handwriting sample or a DNA sample or a list of other physiological things from your body to open something, right? Um, and the idea is there, and this deals with the Fifth Amendment, not the Fourth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment, of course, is the right against self-incrimination. So you don't have to, you, you're allowed to invoke the Fifth Amendment and not testify against yourself. But that's the key point. Is it testimonial in the, in the legal understanding, right? So the law as it stands now would say that providing your thumbprint is not testimonial. You're not testifying to uh, something because you're merely providing something that you are. The law cannot compel you to divulge something that is in your mind. Um, so, and this is weird. To lawyers, I think this makes more sense than it does, I think, to mere mortals like the rest of us, which is that like there's this bizarre distinction between what you know and what you are. So like you can't be divulged to give up something that you know. Um, and the reason for this makes a lot of sense, right? If you're in you know 18th century Britain uh, or in, in colonial America, right, and the and the police uh, you know throw you in the stockade and like torture you, like give us the name of the guy of the you know Boston Tea Party dude or whatever, right? Like and they like beat you, right? We don't want we don't want that. We don't we don't want the police to like beat people or torture people. Um, so we have this protection that's built into our constitution. So I've met a number of lawyers who have said for this reason. I don't use the biometric on my phone, that I only use a typed password because you can't be forced to divulge it. Um, so there's that. Um, you know, and different courts have come down on it differently, but we don't have a very clear federal standard as to, as to how, that, how that goes. Um, to answer your second question about the border, yeah, so, so I mentioned that guy from, from CCA, the California College of the Arts, um, Aaron Gach, um, who's part of this, this ongoing lawsuit in, in Massachusetts. Um, he had that exact experience, right? So where he said to the, where the officer said, can you unlock your phone? He said, no, there was a little back and forth. And eventually he said, well, you know, I have to go to work tomorrow. And he, and he unlocked his phone and handed it to the officer. And then they took it away. And there's many other cases of this. They took it into a separate room and they came back uh, 10 minutes later. And he believes, I think reasonably, that they imaged his phone, right? They, they captured and copied all of the data off of the device. Um, without even breaking the crypto because he'd unlocked it, right? Um, for device, it, for uh, there are these digital forensic tools. Cellbrite is the big one. There's others. Um, but just the other day, I was poking through the Department of Homeland Security website where they evaluate like a number of the. There are all these companies that like some company called like Black Bag Solutions. Like who comes up with these names? Like, like that's like you know you can go on the DHS website and they have like a 20-page report of like okay we evaluated you know the services of this company and you know it can break these versions of Android and these versions of iOS. And we tested it on these versions of the iPad, and like it, you know, it says all of the things that they can do, and it's this kind of constant cat and mouse game between Apple and Google, largely, and these kind of uh, device or uh, you know forensics companies on the on the other side. Um, so I would say, it, you know, if you're the type of person who is constantly upgrading your stuff, you have all the latest like software patches, you have the latest, you know, uh, uh, you know, device. Um, then you're probably more protected than if you have a three-year-old or four-year-old Android device. Um, but then going back to the biometrics point for a second, when I, one of the articles that I wrote at Ars Technica having to do with the border, right? if you've ever used Face ID or if you've ever watched somebody use Face ID, you could imagine a situation where a border officer, you're at the border, you have a phone that has Face ID, the officer takes your phone from you and just holds it up to your face. Doesn't even make you do anything, right? Like, and that's like, that sounds crazy, but it seems entirely plausible to me um, that, that that's a scenario that the, that the border agents could use. And depending on how you know, well-intentioned or ill-intentioned you think they are, uh, that may you know, lead to some interesting results. <laughs> We're going to do one last OK. Question.
Oh, yeah, please. I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. No problem. Thank you so much for hey, your talk. thank you. And for highlighting uh, the Oakland Commission at the end. Yeah. I was wondering, in your research, what are the most innovative policy strategies, both in the U.S. and abroad, that you've come across to address this disconnect between increasingly outdated um, legislation and mm -hmm. increasingly advanced and invasive technologies? Yeah, I mean, I, one thing that I've often said to, I've literally said this to members, to high-ranking members of the OPD, um, is I said, look, you know, one thing that would really help, I think a lot of people, like, if you're the type of person who, and a lot of this kind of comes down to how you feel about capital G government, how you feel about the capital G police, or capital P police, I think that's how you spell police, um, uh, you know, in general, right? If you're, if you're somebody, if you're, if you're uh, a, a person of color, if you come from a community that's maybe been disproportionately policed in the past, you might feel differently than somebody like me who generally has not had very many interactions with the police uh, in, my, in my lifetime. Uh, you know, that's lucky for me. Uh, I recognize that that's not true of everybody. Um, but I think one thing that, that police could do if they wanted is to be much more transparent, not only to lawmakers, but to the public. I've literally said to, to like, you know, top ranking members of OPD, I said, look, you guys should have just like an open house day where you like bring out all your cool stuff, you bring out your drones, you bring out, bring out your drones, um, bring out your, uh, you know, bring out all your stuff and just let people see it and interact with it and understand it and ask questions because I can tell you it's my job to ask the police questions and very rarely do I get honest, straightforward answers. <laughs> and, and if I don't get honest, straightforward answers, very, very few people are going to take the time to try to get answers from them. I mean, we have you know, lawyers who sue over public records, we have lawmakers who try to compel answers, but I think police themselves could do a better job because if you want, if you believe or want to believe that the police are trying to do good in the world, are trying to put away bad people for legitimate reasons, I would like to believe that, that the devices that they have, that they can articulate why they want it, right? And that, it, that they want to have like a particular reason. Um, I haven't seen any like open house like that in the way that I would want. Um, but that's just like an idea that I think is something very simple that police could do, um, uh, you know, or just like, and it wouldn't necessarily have to be just like, hey, we're going to be hanging out with our drones, but just like, you know, lawmakers upon request could, you know, you could come up with some mechanism by which they could do that. I, I do think like a public day where just like, just like, all right, here it is, come hang out, you know, um, I think it'd be really interesting because, um, uh, Oakland police does not itself own drones, but the Alameda County Sheriff does. The Alameda County Sheriff regularly loans out its drones to Oakland and to other Bay Area law enforcement agencies. Um, and we know this because not only they, I mean, do they say, but like because of Oakland's policies, Oakland quickly releases reports through the Privacy Commission that say like, we had this situation at this time. This thing happened. An officer got shot. We called Alameda County 10 minutes later. We put up a drone five minutes after that. It flew for 12 minutes, right? There's like a log of like things that happen. Um, uh, I would love to see that in other cities um, to know like, because, and this is, and again, you may feel that law enforcement is being more or less sneaky where like maybe your city doesn't have it, but like the county sheriff does have it or the FBI does have it or the you know, city next door does have it and they're willing to share uh, you know, their toys with one another. Um, so I think just having kind of a better understanding of how it's used, um, I think would go a long way uh, to, you know, assuaging weirdos like me. Um, <laughs> but anyway, thank you for your question. And thank, let's all give a round of applause to Sue Thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.